Ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Roberts joins me today on Myth Vision Podcast. And let me tell you, you don't want to miss this deconversion story. She was part of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit movement, Pentecostalish type of uh, movements where there's laying on of hands and bl- casting out demons and doing prophecies and gold dust and vomiting and uh, just unbelievable stuff that I am aware of when I was in the Christian movement. Uh, One of the earlier versions of Christianity I had been in was extremely uh, spirit filled. You don't want to miss this episode. This is so good. Make sure you guys join the Patreon. All of this stuff is released early there and you help us grow at Myth Vision. Thank you. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Derek Lambert, your host. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking to somebody who was once, uh, if I could use the term, completely consumed with Christianity. Uh, their entire life, their focus, their every thought, their every deed was all a reflection of uh, what what they were doing and God was watching. You know, So <laughs> I'm super excited to hear some of what your story is about. Um, but I only have your first name, and I'd have to look at Facebook to even remember the last name. So Catherine, I should have put my last name on there, Derek. I'm sorry. Roberts. It's okay. It's Roberts. okay. My last name is Roberts. Catherine Roberts. Yeah. So I have no clue about your story. No. All I did is I saw you on Facebook on the Normalizing Atheism group, and you were just like, I'm ready to share my story. And I said, well, let's find out what it is. I don't know yeah. anything about it. So yeah. tell us about you. Tell us about your journey, what your life is like, what, what it was like in the religion. And then of course, yeah, towards the climatic uh, conclusion. Sure. Well, I was like, I was what, you know, I, I, a born again believer, um, and for 20, almost 24 years. Mm. So, um, you know, it's a lot to, it's a lot to unpack in, in, you know, uh, it was a long time. Um, but basically, I considered myself an atheist right up until I was 28. Um, but I didn't really, I know now I didn't know what an atheist was. Um, I thought the same thing that a lot of people think that atheists are just people who secretly hate God and want to sin. Um, and so, um, but I never went to church or anything uh, until I was 28. And I think what got me there was I was really, really depressed Um, lonely. I was a single mother of three kids who were, you know, under the age of five. Um, And I was just severely depressed. And a friend of mine uh, told me about uh, Jesus and, you know, said that God loved me and wanted me to have a better life. And, um, and I, I guess her words really struck a chord with me. So off I went to church at 28 for the first time in my life. And she was Pentecostal. So I I went to a Pentecostal church and I remember them singing, um, are you washed in the blood? And I looked over and I said, do you guys really like, will they be bringing a blood to wash in? Like I had no clue, no clue. Um, And so but I, I, what happened is I got so immersed into it so quickly. I had an instant friends circle, like huge um, social life all of a sudden in church. You know what uh, what it's like uh, right from the beginning. I was in um, women's ministries and Bible studies and new converts class and pre-service prayer and church twice on Sundays and once during the week. And so my depression lifted. And to me, that was evidence that I had a supernatural experience. And it confirmed to me that everything that these people were saying had to be was was right, Right. you know. And so I I put aside a lot of questions for a long time. I was told, you know, I was a baby Christian. So just, you know, put those kinds of any doubts, put that aside for a while. And, And a while turned into. 24 years. Mm. 
So yeah. technically, if it doesn't break, if it does, if it if it works, don't break it. Of course, <laughs> it fixing. So yeah. why buck? Why buck against this thing that worked and helped you? Yeah. Like, well, I think it was more like um, it became my life really quickly, and so I, I I got immersed into like this bubble of of theology and doctrine and and the same circle of people, and so it became my my universe, you know, um, and I was a Bible literalist. So, uh, you know, I was, so I, I lived a very strict life. You can imagine what, a you know, I mean, I didn't read a secular book for 20 something years. Um, I only tasted whiskey when I was almost 50, wow. you know? Um, yeah. I didn't listen to anything other than Christian music for over two decades didn't watch an X-rated movie, horror movies I thought would get me possessed. Spirits, you know? demons, especially yep. coming from a Pentecostal. Did you stay in the Pentecostal church? No, or? I got, uh, no, I went even deeper. I went even oh. deeper. Eventually the Pentecostal wasn't even religious enough for me. I became an independent Pentecostal. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, I a lot of strange things in the Pentecostal church. I'm sorry, but um, but there is. I mean, that's that's the uh, that's the facts. I've seen some really strange things, and and I'm embarrassed now when I look back to the stuff that I believed. You know, that I swallowed hook, line, and sinker, just all kinds of bullshit stuff. Um, you know, gold dust falling from the sky and people getting gold fillings miraculously and people losing 50 pounds in church over, you know, the, all this kinds of weird out there kind of stuff. Have you, do you have any experience like in, in any kind of Pentecostal circles? Well, it wasn't Pentecostal, but it was in the vein of the same movement of uh, gifts and prophecy and yes. spirit-filled demon possessions, casting out demons, things like that. I've, I've cast out so many demons, I'm telling you. <laughs> and then, or have you well, I've never, because it's such a psychological, crazy hypnosis type situation. People wouldn't understand yeah. unless they were there. They go, how can you crazy people do that? They don't get the social structure, the environment. Ooh, which yeah. We get like primed to do it. And and there's something special about them laying their hands on you and how much I got you know, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> uh, like you know, it's weird. I don't know, but ah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was there, That's I was weird. there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, people falling, you know, laughter, crying. Um, there was a thing called travailing that we used to believe in. And that was like, we believed that the Holy Ghost was birthing something spiritually through us. So, you know, you could see people on the floor groaning in pain, like they're in childbirth. I mean, Jesus, I'm so embarrassed now to even say it, but wow. that is the kind of shit I've prayed over people in church and they've like, they've been throwing up and everybody like praising Jesus because that's a deliverance, you know, um, Oh God. Oh my gosh. It's yeah, one time I think the worst thing I ever saw. This was one of the things that like was the first time my husband and I said, you know, maybe we should just, you know, rethink a few things. Um, but we were at a church in um Nova Scotia, and uh they had a pastor, uh, a preacher come in from the Toronto Airport Church. I don't know if you are familiar. No. Um, yeah, well, he was like he said so he was preaching and stomping his foot and whinnying like a horse during his sermon. And people were crawling around on the floor looking for gold dust. And it was a new church that we had uh, gone to. And my husband and I looked at each other and we're like, this is something, I mean, for all of the crazy things that I believed and participated in, that was like, I think the first wake up call, like, holy shit, this is a bit, out there. So this, this brings me to a question. I think that is important. You, were you just a church goer for many years and then you became someone in the church? Um, okay. So two weeks after I got saved, I guess you know what that, what, what, yeah. Oh, yeah. what I'm referring to. Okay. Some people don't know. I mentioned something about speaking in tongues the other day and, and this Catholic woman had 
no clue what I was talking about. Yeah, you're not um, saved if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. According exactly. To, yeah, you have well, exactly. to. Yeah, you had to. Yeah. I got to shoot, I got to. Yeah, you have well, to. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so I preached, I spoke my, I gave my first message, I guess I was sharing my testimony. I was saved for two weeks. I spoke at a Sunday school class of young kids. Um, and very quickly, like after I got converted, I saw a woman preacher and I'm like, I want to do that. And so I started working towards it. And, um, I, you know, I, I started speaking at women's conferences and meetings and different churches. Um, and then I actually got ordained in 2013. And I was a senior pastor from 2011 to uh, 2017. So I pastored a small church um, in uh, on the prairies, on the Canadian prairies. Wow. Little house, little church on the prairies. <laughs> And it was it was definitely Holy Ghost filled type. Oh yes, yes, yes. It was. We were the talk of the town. It was. It was a tiny little town with probably six or eight churches, and ours was the only Holy Rollers. Oh man, <laughs> we were the only ones with those prayer cloths to cover up the women's legs when they fell on the floor when you prayed for them, right? Uh. <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting. Probably some people watch this and go, "What? You had to speak in tongues to show? Well, how do you show you had the Holy Spirit, right? You had no, to speak in so, Yeah, yeah. It was, that was one of my main um, topics to teach on. I remember I was invited to different churches to speak on it. I wrote a Bible study on on the on the, yeah the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like what a, a waste of time, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's just yeah. amazing what. People looking at you right now could not imagine how deep of insanity, you know, in that yeah. world within our mind of, of this, this worldview yeah. we really we're in. And too often we see, yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, cult, Scientology, cult, you know, Mormons, cult. People are okay to say that. When you start getting into Christianity or any versions of it, they start going, yeah. oh, stop using that word. We're not a cult. No. The stuff that we were in, even though it's not maybe a high control, depending on where you're at, um, yeah. it's not as high control as JWs and others. It's yeah. a cult. This is a oh, wild absolutely. Um, according to the bike model, um, I, I, I mean, I printed it off and highlighted all of the stuff that um, you know that I experienced, and probably ninety percent of it. Yeah, like we didn't shun people like if they left our church we didn't say you know oh, I, can't, I can't even say that i mean oh we yes, left some church a yeah. pastor said a pastor said that within a year we were either going to be divorced or one of us was going to have cancer so you didn't get shunned but you freaking well knew that you were not your friends after you left that church right, right? and mm -hmm. i i would tell the same thing to people in my congregation i remember a, a, an elderly lady wanted to go to a different church in town and they didn't believe in healing. And I was very concerned about her health and didn't think, you know, and I, I remember telling her that it's a matter of life and death where you go to church. So, you know, I mean, that's a lot of friggin' pressure. My old house church that I went to, because it was a house church who was run by a woman, so pastor, right? And she was into this stuff. She taught me a lot of this. Uh, she used to get mad when she'd find out that I had visited another church and she'd say, they're not teaching line upon line, precept upon precept. This was a common phrase. Yes. For us, it was the full gospel. You, you know, if they weren't, they weren't full gospel, which literally just meant they didn't speak in tongues. You know, that was the only part of the gospel they were missing. <laughs> yeah. And to them, that's, that's everything. I mean, that's, yeah. that's the number one thing. And, Sometimes they'd have this whole like ask the Lord for forgiveness and ask for him to to forgive you and whatnot. They'd have altar calls. And then after that, like a choo-choo train, everybody went to the altar, had to go back to this private room where everyone together held hands and, and tried to kind of like train everyone to speak in tongues to show that they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. Yeah. I spent a few hours of my life trying to convince people that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and could speak in tongues. <laughs> <laughs> I just figure that's an important part of this whole thing being how crazy we were and that and, and, and your story. Yeah. You know? 
and also like you know I, I we believed in divine healing and so um i know people who have died from cancer because they wouldn't they were believing that jesus was their healer and so like i know a lot of people who looked at it like a badge of spiritual honor if you didn't seek natural help for something mm. you know um and then it was frowned upon like for me um i've suffered with depression all my life and but i wouldn't take medication i tried it over the years but the guilt of not even like i didn't feel guilty i just truly believed that i don't shouldn't take the medication because jesus was better somehow you know um so i really suffered needlessly for years with with depression only i didn't call it depression of course they were all spiritual attacks then you know you learn i learned to rephrase a lot of shit that happened in my life so oh, there, that was just attacks from the devil you bring up so many important things when you say that that could take a show itself just talking about how these mental health in the church huh mental health in the church exactly and how they are everything's a spirit everything's a demon or a spirit or a ghost or an energy or something and they they just schizophrenia those are spirits talking in your head that's not yes. real and that yes. I interviewed a guy who actually said that on my channel i'm so not cool with stuff like that so yeah um, that's the harms of these things so exactly through, i was gonna say take me through this you become a leader, but I suspect that there are other leaders or other people still part of this. What started to happen to you? I mean, I when mean, you're that deep, yeah, I, I don't know if there's words you can really put. It's, it is, yeah. It first of all, there's not enough. I, I don't have the words to fully explain how my God belief was the center of my being like every decision I made from 1996 until 2018 was filtered through what I believed was the truth of the Bible. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned about reading books and that kind of stuff. You know, I didn't read secular books or listen to secular music, but it goes so much deeper than that. Like how I spent my money and what jobs we had and and how we raised our kids and you know the kinds of people we hung out with all of those things everything was all tied to jesus in the center of it um and so it was quite a transition to come out of it and the first thing i think the first thing that made me question is well i know um, is the whole matter of homosexuality. Um, my son is gay. And when he, when he came out in high school, I um, was going to write a book about what the Bible says about homosexuality. Because I was convinced when I started that in my research, I will find out that all these people that say that God hates gays are wrong. Um, and so that's, I set out on that mission and found out that it, that's not the case. The Bible is very anti-gay. And I couldn't reconcile that in my head, you know. Um, and I, I, I remember going to interview a ex-priest who had left the priesthood because he was gay. Well, he was forced out because he, they found out he was gay. Um, and he was such a wonderful human being like we had brunch in this really nice restaurant and we spent hours talking and and it was the first time i opened my mind to think like how could god hate somebody like i think this man is wonderful and i would i wish nothing but good things for him right. and then knowing that the god that i said i love would send him to hell and mm -hmm. send my son to hell and so of course when i'm faced with the conflict of it just doesn't seem very moral for god to want to punish my child you know and so uh, that's a conflict you know it, it's like i'm suddenly the morality of the god that i thought was the end all and be all of morality 
wasn't so much. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't figure it out. How could you want to hurt my little sweet baby? Like he's just a friggin' wonderful human. It's interesting you say that because I've had people when I've done shows say, you think you're more moral than God. Yes. At this point, that's exactly what I actually say. Yes. Now, and I know that they don't like to hear that, but I say it I all the time. Plenty of text to show I wouldn't do things this way. Now they'll go, but they, that's why you're not God. Oh, okay. Whatever you want to say, buddy. Sure. But the point I'm making is there was, a, I had to swallow a pill on Calvinism because I had become a Calvinist. God okay. predestined everything. And the biggest pill was God literally like created hell, created heaven, a place ready, prepared for people in destruction in Romans nine, I was looking at Paul and he's like, uh, for vessels prepared for destruction and vessels prepared yeah. for glory. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, hold on. Like you're actually, how, how can I say you're all loving? I just don't get it. He literally says, Jacob, I loved Esau. I hated. Right. So I'm like, okay, yeah. he must hate people. And I thought to myself, what if one of my own family members doesn't believe in this God? Did he predestine yeah. some of them to cook? And yeah. I, that, was not the that wasn't the straw that broke the camel's back for me. It was just it was just something in my head I had always thought about, and I, I couldn't yeah. quite rationalize it with my belief. Yeah. You know, so I, I remember like in the early years of my uh, Christianity, when I was first reading the Bible, I, I remember questioning a lot about the morality in there. I remember calling my pastor and asking about. Um, Oh, who, uh, gee, I'm forgetting the Bible stories now. Tamar was raped by her brother. Um, and then um, I think he, she had to, she had to marry him or something. And, and, uh, and, and I remember saying like, this just seems like so, you know, and then you know, all of the times uh, that, that God would send people in and say like, kill all of them. Don't take anybody as prisoners, kill all of the kids and all of the, like, how did we miss all of the, immorality in the bible i don't understand i mean she, god sent youngster or, or sent bears to kill youngsters for making making fun of, of the prophet's bald head yeah you know? and there's some people who will say oh well that's a allegory but even if it is that's well, like yeah well then well that's the problem because then then now you're gonna now you have to decide what's going to be allegory and what's going to be not um, and so, you know, now you're just cherry picking, which I guess all theists are cherry pickers. That's, that's my, uh, that's my take on it. You have to be, yeah, because you if you read the Bible completely, you're <laughs> going to become an atheist. I'm sorry. I tell people all the time to read the Bible. Or at least not, especially if you're really thinking about it, not filtered through a pastor telling you what it must mean, what it must say, go read it yourself. Yeah. You might walk away and go, okay. This is this is definitely a Bronze Age tell or some very old uh, maybe history mixed with myth yeah. here. Uh, yeah. That that just isn't something I would apply to today for my own personal life. Personally, yeah. I, mean, I, I can find all the good stuff here in pagan narratives. I can find all the good stuff in other stories in modern movies. Sure. I don't need the Bible, so to speak. But um, let me ask you this: you you mentioned your son, and I know that had to be very painful being yeah. in Christianity, knowing your God isn't okay with these guys yeah these people you know so yeah. so what that started it but what That's, happened yeah that that started it and i eventually got to the place where i guess i was probably a deist um i was i had gone through my doctrine to the point where i thought hell seems to be immoral so i don't i don't believe in hell um, you know, an, an infinite punishment, an in, infinite torment for something as 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 innocent as not accepting Jesus. That is that's horribly immoral, you know. So I, eventually, I had whittled my doctrine down to the fact that God just exists, and I can't know anything else about it um, because I couldn't get behind the Bible anymore. Yeah. Once I discovered that I'm like more moral than the God of the Bible, then I was like, well, then how do I know about God? Then if I don't, if the Bible isn't the book where I find out, you know, where do I go? Do I go to somebody else's religious book? Um, you know, where do I go? Do I go to nature to look for God? I didn't know. Um, 
And so I just let it, I just left it like that for probably a couple of years, just thinking God exists and someday we'll find out. Um, and then I had this conversation with my daughter about different theories of, um, of how uh, mankind came about. And it was just an innocent conversation. We were talking about the, the simulation theory. Uh -huh. um, and it was the first time in my whole life that I ever stopped to think, see, I question all of the doctrine of the Bible, but I never questioned whether or not the God existed. And when we started talking about other plausible explanations, you know, and I'm not saying that we're a simulation, right. but it makes just as much sense as Adam and Eve in the Bible and, and a talking snake and, and the fall of man and all this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. So it was the first time that my mind opened to that, to the fact that, hey, what about the God belief? And as soon as, like, it was instant, Derek. It was, it was instant. Like, I woke up the next morning and my life had fallen apart. It was really hard. How did that um, work with church? Because now you're, I mean, you, you just stopped going. I had left. Oh, oh, yeah, I skipped that part. Um, I had left the church in 2017 because we um, we oh, I was we we had our own business and I was working and I was volunteering with victim services and I was writing and I just couldn't do all of it. So right. um, I resigned and that gave me the um, freedom, the freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And the and the time to. Because all of my reading before that was all about, like, how can I teach this to the congregation? You know, I, I wasn't so much examining it for myself, maybe. Right. And and it was it was in that we, when we retired and we moved here in the middle of nowhere. I live in the woods, practically. Um, just me and the husband and the dog. And we started talking. We were talking, like, every night about all of these things that we believed. And, and we realized that none of it made any sense. You, and you both together are on the same. Yes. Road. Wow. Well, good for him. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good. I'm glad. Yeah, I don't know how people go through it separately. I mean, we've been married. We were married 30 years at that point. We've been married over 32 years now. Um, and I can't imagine if he, if, if he had stayed, you know, that kind of a believer not but, sure how that would work. Yeah. Yeah. That must be even more difficult. And as it is, we went through a very hard transition um, because we didn't know how to live without this Jesus belief. Wow. And it was incredibly, incredibly disorienting um, and confusing. I went into a deep depression. Um, I would get up in the morning and sit on the couch and think, well, I don't even know what to do. Like, what do I do during the day? It, it's, it's very hard to explain. Like when you're calling and your, you know, your, your vision for the future was all, was all tied to Jesus. So I felt like my past was nothing but bullshit and my future was all of a sudden gone. And I was, I was stuck. And plus, I didn't know a single person who wasn't a Christian, um, didn't know what an atheist even was, let alone if, if I was an atheist. Um, and uh, so I ended up going online and Googling things like what happens when you don't believe in God anymore. And uh, I found some really good resources that just really saved my freaking life, really. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Um the recovering from religion uh foundation oh just they were the first people that we called and i didn't even know what to say like uh, like um i don't believe in god anymore and i don't know how to live you know and they just they were so freaking great um the clergy project we got involved with that right away and that's fabulous organization for people like like me who were in the ministry or people who are still in the ministry but no longer believe um and then I got um, therapy for religious trauma syndrome through the Secular Therapy Project, another great organization. And so I got 12 free sessions of therapy wow. and I needed it. Yeah. I, I needed it to get my I mean, back on straight. 
I have to say this as someone who's been where you're at in a way. And in fact, just based on what you told me, my the movement I was part of was very sister-like to the movement you were part of. You guys yeah. seemed to may have gone a little bit further potentially than, than the one I was yeah. part of just by a few aspects. But I wouldn't be shocked if gold dust stuff would have eventually came on the scene. But she died. She told me one time. I, I loved her. Her name was Ellie. She told me one time, she said, Jesus told me I could hear the voice of him. You know, you know, you have these, you know how deep you get to the point you're hearing things in your head. Mm -hmm. You're trying to think that was that God's voice, all the weird yes. stuff. And yes. she said that Jesus told her she would be alive at his coming, right? Like the, the, she was going to be alive. She's dead now. And so was the girl that was a sweetheart that worked with her in the church. But uh, they were beautiful, wonderful people. See, isn't that, delusional. The, isn't that the hardest part? I see wonderful people. I don't have one bad thing to say about one any Christian that I met in the 24 years that I was a Christian. Every single person I met was sincere. I, I can't think of any that weren't. Yeah. Um, just sincerely wrong. Um, but wonderful, beautiful people. It breaks my heart. You know, I, I like I said, I've seen people. I know people who have died. I know somebody was cutting off their own tumor, like with a pair of scissors. It, it's, it's fucking dangerous. It's, it's dangerous religion is what it is. You know, I, I know a young man who was a worship leader um, and uh, his mind started to go. He ended up in a um, like on a psychiatric ward and he his parents kept uh, taking him out and putting him in uh, religious um, yeah. counseling. Um, and he ended up jumping off of a cliff thinking that he could fly. Like he, he had mental he was mentally ill and needed help yeah. you know real help well final question mm -hmm. and i think this is a good reflection you said when you turned 28 you finally started drinking the juice uh, the jesus juice yeah prior to that you didn't you you weren't you know i guess people a lot of christians like to say oh i was an atheist but became a christian eh, you didn't really know crap yeah. you know it's exactly. very rare that someone actually knows and studies and and then comes to a conclusion of conversion. Yeah, I can't like, imagine. Yeah, I can't imagine. Right. So my question is, how happy are you now? I have the best life in the freaking world. I am so, I can't imagine. If I get any happier, there would have to be two of me. I'm to contain it, I'm telling you. Um, I mean, I'm 53 and I feel like I'm just, I've only just started to live in a, in a lot of ways, but yet at the same time, I've had like a very rich life, even as a Christian, I've, I've done a lot of things and, you know, met a lot of wonderful people and stuff, but now it's like having an adult brain and that might be hard for some people to understand, but to make my own decisions based on rationality and logic instead of seeking some supernatural direction or revelation, that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very fulfilling. I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm authentic. I am my authentic self. Wow. That's... I don't care what anybody believe, what anybody thinks of me anymore. I have lost all of that fear of um, ruining my reputation. If people don't, I'm, Friggin' weird. <laughs> I know I'm weird. Um, I have a friggin' unusual life and I don't care. I love it. You know, I know I'm I, I I'm an atheist who used to be a pastor and people are a little bit afraid of me and that's okay. I'm as happy as a I say happy as a pig and shit. But my husband's a farmer and he says pigs don't actually like shit. So <laughs> Oh, it doesn't work. No, um <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm so happy. Would you say it was due to the not only the time being away, you kind of got to mourn the death of your religion uh, in a, in a healthy way because you were you were able to get the treatment you needed. Without yeah. that, you'd be you, there's no telling how you would be yeah. at this point, right? Yeah, I um, I can't I can't begin to express how much that religious trauma therapy helped um, because. When you're indoctrinated for decades, your brain, you know, my brain patterns just weren't 
rational, if, if that makes sense. You know, um, I didn't know how to think for myself so much. So, um, yeah, it's it's so much better. Makes perfect sense. That's how yeah. I feel about it. I'm I'm super happy to be. Yeah. I yeah. I don't want, and I don't want to carry a chip on my shoulder, but I do want to educate and expose these ideas to more people. Yeah. So they understand yeah. that life I, is great outside. You don't have yeah. to stay in. And yeah. I find it strange when people say, well, an atheist doesn't have anything to live for. Or I used to think atheists must be the saddest, most miserable people in the world. But hey, I get to, I get to pick out my own friends, which I never got to do before. I get to, you know, go where I want, watch what I want, say what I want. I spent 20 something years not being able to say things like my back is killing me or I'm dying with a cold. We, you know, I had to be careful of every word and every thought. <laughs> and my, it, that's true. It's It was mind control for 24 years. And my husband says, he says that it's like a brain space opened up. And that's true. When all of that religious doctrinal bullshit was gone. Um, it, it's like having a wide open mind. Wow. Well yeah. said, Catherine. I, I really want to, uh, you know, plug any of your stuff when it does come out. Let me know. We can always do an updated video. We can go into sure. specific topics, of course, but I'll put it down yeah. in the description. Any yeah. final words? Someone out there right now, they're, they're doubting they're afraid. You already know what I'm talking about. They are terrified. Yeah. What would you say to that person right now? I would say that you're not alone, even though you feel like you're alone, because I, I thought I was alone. Everybody, it seems like everybody around you believes in God. I went to my doctor when, when that happened and I was talking about what happened to me and he tried to convince me there was a God. So you do can, you can feel very alone in it. Um, but you're not, you're not alone. There's a lot of great resources out there. I've named some of them, you know, reach out to someone, um, take, take things slowly. That, that would be a, a, a good piece of advice. Mm -hmm. When I became an atheist, I wanted everybody to know and I was mad at everybody, you know? Um, and that's, you know, it's just, it should be when, when you're questioning that kind of stuff, it should be all about you at that time. Don't worry about, deconverting anybody just focus on yourself wow. and uh, learn about religious trauma especially if you're coming from the kind of background that i came from because it is traumatic wow. yeah thank yeah. you so much this is wonderful. i had so much fun i'm so glad that i came on thanks I for having too. me I'm, look i hope this helps somebody watching i know that yeah. me and you have a similar background in that respect i'm glad i didn't go into the ministry like i was going to yeah, uh, I had changed my views based on the text like often. And um, and so I thought, well, if I end up becoming a pastor, plus I had struggled with addiction throughout the years. But I thought if I became a pastor of a flock, I always wanted to be. But yeah. like, I also was kind of afraid, like my view is going to change in a year or two and I'm stuck under a particular denomination. And now what? You know, what do I leave yeah. this? Now I got to go. There's so much of a headache to think about with this. But uh Thank yeah. you so much. I relate to everything that yeah. you have said, literally. Yeah. Uh, I can't I can't think of a single thing that you haven't said that in some way really uh, I can relate to that. So thank it's you. It's hard to believe that there's people out there like me and you, hey, in 2021, that people still believe that kind of stuff. That's what that's what I think. But they, but they're still out there. And it just takes one second for you and me to really put to think we can think that way for one moment and realize how closed off the thinking is. Yeah. And then you can realize, ah, I can see how that's possible. Yes. But yeah. that is such a thick cloud of, I, yes. I don't know how to describe walls, brick walls of thinking. And it's, Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's very small thinking. Um, I, I say it's like being in a bubble and you're in a tiny little bubble. You think the bubble is your whole life. You think the bubble is the whole universe. And, and it's not. It's just a tiny little bubble. And there's all kinds of bubbles around. Everybody's got their own little religious bubble. And they all think that they're in the friggin' universe. No. Get out of your bubble. The world is big. It's big and beautiful and exciting. Wow.
right? Yes. Well yeah. said. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Time for an altar call. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just blasphemed the Holy Spirit in like three different languages. Uh, I know, I know. That's okay. I'll I'll see you in hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is funny how they interpret that whole blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Is a some of them interpret it as a mockery of the of the speaking in tongues, and it's like. Um. Really, dude? Anyway, uh, we have much <laughs> more to talk about, Catherine, because you and me have similar cultish backgrounds. Yeah. And we were drinking that Kool-Aid like no other. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So yeah. if you guys are wondering and you're struggling and you just don't know, you can always join us here at Myth Vision because never forget, we are Myth Vision.